Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this NCAR Explorer series lecture called Turning Down the Thermostat Climate Intervention Using Stratospheric Aerosols with Dr. Yaga Richter and Dr. Doug McMartin. My name is Dr. Lorena Medina Luna, and I am an education designer and a lead organizer for the NCAR Explorer series. The National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding the earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all these systems to our society. I'm really glad to be with you all today to learn more about the computational modeling work that Yaga and Doug will be presenting about. For this lecture, we'll be taking questions at the end but please definitely submit any questions that you might have during the talk using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this web page, you can see the Slido window just below where you're seeing the live stream. The live stream. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the poll tabs, both of which are found in the blue bar across the top. And definitely be sure to join the Slido to add your thoughts on our word cloud question, which is, what do you think of when you hear climate intervention or geoengineering? We'll get to that um, after I present our speakers and before they start their lecture. This lecture is being recorded and will be available on our NCAR Explorer series webpage, in addition to any past lectures that you might be interested in checking out. Um, with us again, we have Dr. Yaga Richter, who is a scientist in the climate change research section of the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at NCAR, or CGD. Her areas of expertise and scientific interests include gravity waves and their parametrizations in global climate models, middle atmospheric dynamics, quasi-biennial oscillations, or QBO, whole atmosphere climate modeling, subseasonal to subseasonal forecasting, and geoengineering. And if you're not aware, in 2016, um, Dr. Richter also is, um, co-founded these NCAR Explorer series, the, the whole series, in an effort to work with scientists to speak about the work that is relevant for the community. So I'm really honored to be able to work with her in this capacity today. And Dr. Douglas McMartin is a senior research fellow in the Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell University. His research focuses on climate engineering, also known as solar engineering or climate intervention, with the aim of helping to develop the knowledge base necessary to support informed future societal decisions in this challenging and controversial field. Um, Yaga and Doug, uh, I welcome you to turn on your cameras to give a quick hello before we check out the word cloud. Great to see you both. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're still virtual, um, so I appreciate everybody joining us from wherever you might be. And um, let's go ahead and Paula Brett, would you be able to share the word cloud with us? Um, and we do have surveys again that you're welcome to, to fill out and we will be going into those surveys um, during the lecture as well. Great, so thank you so much for uh, a lot of these um, some phrases and words. So yeah, it, it is scary to be, to be thinking about what's happening, but fortunately we have computer models to, to try to help us um, learn before, um, before we do too much implementation. And then we have a lot of scientists that are working in different areas. So I'm really excited to learn more about this field um, as I'm sure our audience is. And with that, thank you so much, Paul and Brett. I'll hand it over to, um, Yaga and Doug to start us off on our lecture. And I'll see you both at the, at the Q&A portion of this talk. Hello, everybody. My name is Yaga Richter, and it's my sincere pleasure to talk to you today with one of my close collaborators, Doug McMartin from Cornell University. As Lorena mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of the NCAR Explorer series. And I believe that it's really important for NCAR to communicate the science that we do here to a broad audience. And in particular, the topic of climate intervention that we'll discuss here is something that would potentially affect every single person on the planet. And hence, I think it's especially important to share this research with you. So thank you all for tuning in today. I will start by describing to you the motivation for carrying out this research. 
which is fundamentally actually really simple. And it boils down to this, the earth is getting hotter and our climate is changing. So what I have here is a picture of the global temperature from 1880 to present day relative to the what we call pre-industrial average in particular case 1881 to 1910 average. And what you see in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s that sometimes we would have a warmer year, sometimes a cooler year, sometimes the warmer years would last a few years, but then we would have a period of cooling. However, since about the 1920s, the global mean temperature has been drastically increasing. And this increase has been really strong uh, since about 1970. So 2021 was the planet's sixth hottest year on record. And the top 10 hottest years on record have all occurred in the last 12 years. And along with climate change and global mean temperature changes come changes in temperature and other extremes. So in July 15, 2011, uh, this Idenkol Lake in China hit 122.4 degrees Fahrenheit. In July and August 2011, these two places, one in Iraq and in Iraq, hit 127.4 degrees Fahrenheit. In this little town in southeast Colorado, Las Animas, experienced a high of 114 degrees Fahrenheit on June 23rd, 2012. And those are just a few examples. And along with changes in temperature, we're also seeing changes in floods and an increase of these events. Here are some pictures from Pakistan in August 2010, India June 2013, Manhattan in October of 2012, and not very far from Ankar here, a flood in Lyons, Colorado in September 2013. Climate change also has brought about increases in drought and fires. So here's a picture of a Morris Reservoir in Noblesville, Indiana in July 2012, completely empty. And everybody who in the Boulder area uh, remembers the Marshall Fire in Superior. And we know that wildfires have been increasing year after year in our area. There's also changes in the polar regions and very large ones. So what I'm showing you here on this top left plot is the average monthly Arctic sea ice extent from 1979 to present day. And you see that the sea ice extent has declined from a little bit over 7 millions of square kilometers to about four and a half. And if we look at year 2022 in the second plot in this blue line, it is way below the average over this time period, which is the gray area. And there were years in which the sea ice was very low. For example, 2012, the sea ice extent was only 4 million of square kilometers. And that affects not only people, but obviously the animals living in those parts of the world. So why are we here? Well, the reason is some uh, increases in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So for the last 650,000 years, the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide or CO2 have always been under 300 parts per million. There was a lot of variability, so it was warmer, it was colder, but these numbers never went over the line of 300 parts per million. Currently, we just checked yesterday, we're at 417 parts per million. So there's been a really, really sharp increase. And we're zooming in on that increase in the figure on the left. And what you see that the changes in carbon dioxide are very well correlated with the changes in the global mean temperature. And you see a lot of more wiggles in the, in the white line here, the global mean temperature, that's internal variability. That's something we can't control, that's just something part of the natural system. But there's a general trend for these temperatures to increase and they're gonna keep increasing as long as we're putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So here is a quick lesson on the Earth's energy budget. There's the sun and it emits shortwave radiation or solar radiation. And most of this radiation is absorbed by the Earth and it warms it. However, then a portion of it is re-radiated back to space in the form of infrared radiation or infrared waves. And then we have a layer of greenhouse gases, so carbon, uh, CO2, uh, water vapor, et cetera. And some of this radiation is re-radiated back 
down to the earth and that's how the earth warms up some more. So sometimes people say then the radiation is strapped or uh, that the CO2 is a blanket over the earth. However you say it, uh, the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the more infrared radiation is going back towards earth and the more the earth warms. So the physics behind this are very straightforward and we're very confident in them. There is really very little question uh, that the more CO2 we put into the atmosphere, the warmer the Earth's gonna get. And these changes associated with increasing carbon dioxide vary with location. So what I'm showing you here is the anomalies of temperature in year 2021 compared to a pre-industrial average. And what you notice that the polar regions, the Northern polar regions warm the most. And then the other feature that you notice is that the land areas are warming more than the oceans. And in general, the Northern hemisphere is warming more than the Southern hemisphere. And the reasons for this have to do with differences in land masses and distributions of oceans, et cetera. And you can see this, that the change is not the same across the United States. So the Western United States is warming a lot more than central and east, except for Florida and the very northeastern states. All right, so what will the future look like? So what I'm showing you here is a figure from a report by an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. And these reports take a very long time to put together by hundreds of scientists, then, and then look at projections of what might happen in the future. And so what we look at is these shared socioeconomic pathways. And those are assumptions that social scientists make about what our emissions might be. And then we look at under those different scenarios, what the temperature, the global mean temperature might be if we follow one of these paths. So these SSPs 1.26 and 1.19 are the optimistic scenarios. So for example, for SSP 1.9, we assume that we'll have net zero CO2 global emissions by around 2050. And this is the only scenario that keeps to the Paris Agreement of keeping the global mean temperature under one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. This is at this point, not very likely. So hence we look at other scenarios like 245, 370 and 585. So the 245 is a moderate scenario in which we assume that we'll keep CO2 emissions remaining at current levels until 2050. And then they're gonna start declining after that. So this is in some ways a hopeful, a reasonable scenario. And then SSP 585 would be the more extreme scenario, business as usual, the society does not change. We just keep emitting more and more CO2. Okay, so right now we're in 2022, we're about 1.2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial. Following this moderate scenario, uh, we would be at one and a half degrees Celsius over pre-industrial, somewhere between 2025 to 2035. And the exact number is not known because these projections are made using different models and there is uncertainty in our projections but we know it will sometime happen between 2025 and 2035. And we'll reach two degrees sometime between 2035 and 2060. And along with that, the Arctic will become seasonally ice-free around 2060 to 2080. And these are the projected patterns of change if we were to reach one and a half, two degrees or even four degrees warming. And these patterns look very much like the pattern I showed you in 2021. So there would be a lot more warming in the polar regions and the continents would be, uh, the land masses would be getting warmer than the oceans. So the number of people affected by climate change would be about 8 billion. However, you see this would not be equal across the world. So along with changes in the temperatures, there will be changes in the water cycle, which manifest themselves in changes in rainfall, which is shown in this bottom figure. So you would see, uh, for example, in Africa, we would increase an increase in precipitation and in other areas we would increase, uh, expect a uh, decrease, but there would be over the majority of land areas, there would be an increase. And you may say, isn't it that good? Don't we want more rain in those countries? Well, the problem is it's not gonna come in a form that's particularly useful. So most of this will come as heavy, intense precipitation and it will be alternate uh, with heat waves and drought. So it actually would not be really good for farming. So basically any extreme weather will increase, which is not what our crops and our populations are used to.
So the recent report, the APC6 assessment report that came out recently, it said it will be impossible to limit warming to one and a half degrees C with no or limited overshoot without stronger 2030 climate action. So one of the key takeaways from this talk that you should take away that elimination of emissions needs to be our top priority. To solve the climate crisis, we need to either get the CO2 out of the atmosphere and there are technologies being made to remove the carbon out of the atmosphere and primarily reduce the emissions. So we would consider any climate intervention. It could be part of a strategy to reduce the worst consequences of climate change, but it's not a substitute for. And so the reason we look for strategy to uh, be a part of the, the, the strategy is because the carbon dioxide removal technologies are not really re available in its scale. And it's not looking like the countries are make, keeping their commitments to reducing CO2 emissions. And we're on a path at least of a moderate scenario that I showed earlier, meaning that more than likely we will reach one and a half degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius and not in the next decade or two. So if the idea of climate intervention sounds scary, I would fully agree with you. So I started this research seven years ago, and I still remember the day when I sat across the desk from my lab director who asked me to work on this topic. I have great respect for him, so I didn't say anything at the time, but my initial reaction was that the idea was really crazy. And I was not really thrilled to be a part uh, of the research going forward. However, uh, I've been in it now for seven years. And the reason I still stick with it is that it's looking less and less likely that we'll be able to avoid doing this. So hopefully we will do all this research and not have to implement any climate intervention. Hopefully society will make choices to keep us underneath one and a half or two degrees Celsius. But if that doesn't happen, I believe that we really wanna do our research thoroughly and research is very slow. So it's, in my opinion, will probably take about 10 to 20 years to just really get the basic understanding of what the consequences might be. But let's hear now from you what uh, you would like to, what you think about that. So let's bring up the poll and then I'll hand it over to Doug. So I think they, um, there's no wrong answer here. Um, I think the distribution of answers here is uh, probably fairly typical. Um, and at some level, the honest answer is we actually don't know because we don't know what the future looks like. Um, I think when I, uh, if we want to move on to the next question, um, when I first started working on climate intervention, uh, which was back in 2006. Um, I was introduced to it a few years before that. Um, if I talked about it, nobody had ever heard of it. Um, and so if you had asked this question 15, 20 years pe ago, people would have looked at you and said, what are you talking about? Uh, and now I would say most people that I've talked with have at least some uh, exposure to the idea. Um, so I started, like I said, about 16 years ago. This was just a fascinating idea, just a curiosity. Uh, didn't really take it seriously uh, as a possibility. I'd been working in, I was an aerospace engineer originally. Um, and the more that I started looking at the subject, the more uh, basically concerned about climate change, realizing in some sense we need an insurance policy. Uh, and then started working with Yaga, actually, I guess about when you were just starting to work on the on the topic yourself, um, moving more or less from looking at uh, sort of very simple climate models to how would you go simulate this in a much, much more realistic climate model. Uh, and that's basically what Yaga and I are going to talk about today. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Um, Carry on. Um, so formal definition of climate intervention or geoengineering is typically a deliberate large scale intervention uh, in the climate to manage climate change. Um, the 
this is something that we only study using climate models. Uh, it's not something. <laughs> there's no no intention right now to actually think about doing this, uh, doing anything like this in the real world. And any decision on that would require uh, some discussion among pretty much everybody on the planet. Uh, the picture here is from a report that I was involved with last year from the U.S. National Academies. Like I said, 15 years ago, pretty much nobody had heard of this. Uh, this is getting more attention now. So we had a report from the U.S. National Academies. There was actually one in 2015 um, and then another one last year. Uh, there was actually a report released this morning uh, from um, uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and, whoops, went the wrong way. So let me just give you a, a really qualitative big picture overview first, and then we'll talk more about the methods for how to intervene in the climate. Um, nothing that we say here changes the fact that we have to cut our emissions uh, and we have to cut those aggressively. And I deliberately made this plot, uh, I took any numbers out of this plot just to sort of get the basic ideas. The problem is that the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is so long that when we get to zero emissions globally, when we're not using fossil fuels anymore at all, that's not when we've solved climate change, that's when we've stopped making it worse. So this black line basically levels off. Um, Yaga mentioned the potential to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's a lot of ideas in that space. Right now, nothing is remotely close to the scale that you would actually need to implement it. Um, so we certainly hope uh, that those technologies will be ready, but we don't really know for sure when they will be ready. Um, so I mentioned uncertainty. Even if I tell you exactly what the future emissions are, there's uncertainty in the climate response. There is, of course, policy uncertainty. We don't know when future, when people will ultimately get to zero emissions. There's technology uncertainty as well. And so you add all of this up. We're sitting somewhere over here. Um, we've already experiencing significant climate impacts, and we can certainly hope uh, that these tools, basically cutting emissions and removing CO2 from the atmosphere, will be sufficient to manage the risks of climate change. Um, but the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, and so that's sort of the context for thinking about solar geoengineering or climate intervention. Um, is a potential way of reducing some of those climate impacts. And of course, it comes with its own risks. Um, these points that I've labeled one and two here, uh, it's clearly colder. You will reduce temperatures, but you don't recover the same climate that you would have if you had neither uh, the greenhouse gases nor the uh, geoengineering. So, so in that sense, point two and point three are different. Um, so this is a picture from the National Academy report again, just talking about the methods. Um, the idea that's best understood and the one that we're going to talk about is putting aerosols into the stratosphere. So an aerosol is a small droplet, uh, in this case, a fraction of a micron. Um, and, this, and then the stratosphere is a higher layer of the Earth's atmosphere where things are stable. So if you put pollution or something like that out of a smokestack near the ground, um, there's turbulence, there's rain, all the weather and so forth, and, the, and that all leaves the atmosphere within a week or so. But if you go high enough in the atmosphere, there's a layer that is stable. Um, and if you put material there, it can persist in, up there for a border a year. Um, so nature gives us this example every now and then. This picture is from the eruption of Mount uh, uh, Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. That put something of order 10 to 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. Uh, and that cooled the planet by something of order um, 0.3 to 0.5 degrees Celsius for the following year or two. Um, it's a little hard to see the signal on this plot, uh, but it's a robust effect after every large volcanic eruption, there's a, there's a dip in the global temperatures. So we know that the idea works if you essentially mimic this by flying aircraft up to the stratosphere uh, and releasing material, you know we know you will cool the planet. Um, 
The other idea we're not going to talk about much, it's much less well understood. The other idea that gets some attention is marine cloud brightening. So this is a satellite picture of clouds off the coast of Europe. Um, and each of these lines you see in the picture is what's called a ship track. It's basically formed from the pollution from the smokestack of the ship. Um, can basically create a cloud where there wasn't one before and that cloud can last for a week. Uh, and you can replicate that not with pollution, but simply by spraying salt water into the clouds. Um, but the physics of that, is much, as I said, is much less understood. So the idea with stratospheric aerosols is this is the same picture as before, but now you put in an additional layer of aerosols into the stratosphere that reflects a little bit of the sunlight back to space. By a little bit, if you were to reflect of order 1% of all of the sunlight back to space, you would cool the planet all the way back to pre-industrial temperatures. So you're not talking about very large changes in the total sunlight in order to maintain um, radiation balance of the planet. Um, and as mentioned, we, you know, we have this natural analog in the form of volcanic eruptions. Um, we can use those uh, basically to help us understand how to model the climate system. And so if our models match the observations after eruptions, then we have greater confidence that those, we can use those climate models for projecting what the impacts of a deliberate uh, intervention would be. So just two quick movies here. The one on the left is from an injection from a, a volcanic eruption in the Northern Hemisphere, um, Kasatochi. Um, and you can see the aerosols primarily stay in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you, uh, this is the, from the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, again in the Northern Hemisphere, but much closer to the tropics, the aerosols spread around the planet um, and they spread into both hemispheres. This eruption was slightly in the northern hemisphere, and so you do see more aerosols in the northern hemisphere. So we're going to come back to those ideas in a minute. Um, so let me pass that back to Yago, who's going to talk about the climate modeling. Yeah, so what do we use to study climate intervention? So you, we use what we call Earth system models, or sometimes climate models, and they have evolved from what we called in the past general circulation models. Basically, all of these take the atmosphere and they divide it into little cubes. And then on these cubes, we solve lots of equations that then uh, show us where the air is blowing and then also have lots of uh, equations to solve chemistry and other reactions in the atmosphere. And then we take this set of equations and we solve them on a supercomputer. And I'll get to it on the next slide how long that takes. And then we can produce simulations of the past, the present, and the future. So if you go to the next slide, Doug, at NCAR in particular, we are developing uh, the community Earth system model. And with the whole atmosphere community climate model is what I'm going to talk about today. That's our model that goes really up high into the atmosphere. So Doug talked about the troposphere and he talked about the stratosphere. And these models, this model even goes higher than that. So it goes into the mesosphere and the lower thermosphere. So about 140 kilometers about the Earth's surface. And um, in some of the studies we're using, we're using the version one of the model. And for some of the recent studies, we're using version two or CSM2. But they fundamentally have a similar structure. So there is the atmosphere, and then there's the ocean model, and then there's the land model. And they're all coupled together. So there are all the interactions. Uh, there's interactions between snow cover and precipitation, evaporation, ocean currents, clouds, convections, etc. And one of the things there is unique to CSM Wacom is that it has a really comprehensive chemistry module. And in particular, CSM2 Wacom 6, their latest version of the model, has really comprehensive chemistry, not only in the stratosphere where you need it for where the injections on sulfur dioxide would go, but also in the troposphere, so we can look at impacts on ozone and other things. And on the right here, I have a picture of what the resolution of the CSM is, and it's about 100 kilometers. So if you look at the United States, and particularly in the state of Colorado, uh, state of Colorado is about 610 kilometers by 450 kilometers. So there would be about 24 model grid boxes. And there's a lot more grid boxes across the world. And don't forget that they go 
in three dimensions. So they go all the way up to 140 kilometers. And we're solving lots of equations in each one of this grid box. So one simulation year takes about six to 10 hours using over 1000 CPUs. So that's why we need a supercomputer. Super so if we wanna run a 30 year simulation with CSM Wacom that takes us about two weeks. All right, next slide. So how do we know that these models work? So the best way we know that they work is we run simulations that start in the past. So in particular here on the left, you see a plot that started in 1850 and the black line is the observations and the other colored lines are different ensemble members of uh, simulations with CSM Wacom. And the different ensemble members are not alike, uh, different ensemble members of the weather forecast where you make a small change in the initial conditions. And then by uh, the effect of the butterfly effect that the forecast keeps spreading. However, the forced response, you see it's very consistent in all of the simulations and it follows the global mean temperature that we see in observations. And I should mention in the models we can play. So if we remove the increase in carbon dioxide from our models, we do not get the increase in temperature uh, after in the uh, recent 50 or 70 years. So that's the nice thing about models. We can learn about a planet without actually changing anything in the real world. And on the right side, is just a plot of ozone. So we verify multiple parts of the system. And again, the black is observations and the blue is our model, just to show you that we're really doing well with this modeling system we're presenting not only the processes on at the bottom at the surface, but also in the stratosphere and particularly ozone here. Then back to you, Doug. For, forgot that I was muted. Um, a lot of the early simulations that were done took a climate model and just like, let's see what happens if you turn down the sun. Um, without even simulating stratospheric aerosols, or they simply specified the aerosols in the stratosphere without simulating all of the processes. The plot on the left here is a typical example of what, what one found. So, that, so the process is like, let's just try something and let's see what happens. Um, and uh, I'll point, point out here, this is effectively comparing, if you look to my, my previous diagram, it's effectively comparing point two and point three. So it's how is the climate system different than if you had neither the greenhouse gases or the climate intervention. And this is a fairly typical result from a lot of the early simulations is, for example, if you put the aerosols in near the equator, you will overcool in the tropics and you'll undercool at high latitudes. It's still colder than it would be uh, if you hadn't done anything. Um, but you haven't managed to restore the climate exactly. So that was sort of the older approach. And then the work that I started doing with Yaga uh, a number of years ago um, was trying to sort of change the, the way of thinking about this problem and saying, rather than just trying something and see what happens, let's actually say what we want to happen. Let's set deliberate goals and see if we can design a strategy to actually meet those goals. So there's a couple of parts to that. One is what's, what goals do you pick? And the answer at some level is we don't know. Um, we picked three. So global temperature is sort of a fairly obvious one. Um, a measure of the uh, equator to pole um, temperature gradient, um, or sorry, the, the, the interhemispheric temperature gradient. So that's making sure that the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere both are cooled uh, appropriately. Um, uh, otherwise, you wind up shifting tropical precipitation. And then this pole to pole temperature gradient to make sure that the high latitudes, uh, you don't have this overcooling in the low latitudes and undercooling at the high latitudes. So that's the first thing is setting the goals. Um, and as I said, a lot of the early simulations might have just injected material at the equator. What we did instead was to say, we get, you know, if you're actually ever want to go do this, you get to choose where you're actually going to put the material. Um, as I showed you in the movies with the volcanic eruptions, 
if you put the material in in the northern hemisphere, it stays mostly in the northern hemisphere. In fact, if you put it further towards the poles, it stays further towards the poles. And you can use that knowledge to actually do better uh, than equatorial injection. And you can use it to maintain those degrees of freedom, those, those goals that I said in the previous slide. The second piece of this is a question of how much do you inject? Um, and this is originally my background as an aerospace engineer, is what I did was, was control theory. Um, and the idea is not fundamentally different from what happens when you take a shower in the morning. You check the temperature of the water. If it's a little too warm, you turn the knob down. If it's a little too cold, you turn the knob up. Um, and in principle, we just did more or less the same thing in the climate model. So we run the climate model for a year. If it's a little bit too cold, um, we inject a little bit less aerosols. If it's a little bit too warm, we inject a little bit more. Um, and so this is just the results from one of those first sets of simulations from a number of years ago, uh, demonstrating that the idea worked. Uh, and this is in the RCP 8.5. This is the, the business as usual or very high emissions scenario. So it's not really a realistic projection of what we at least hope won't happen in the future, uh, but demonstrates the ability to maintain global mean temperature on the top, the interhemispheric temperature gradient in the middle, um, and then we didn't quite meet the equator to pole um, temperature gradient in the bottom. Um, so how did we do this? We started by just saying, all right, let's pick a number of latitudes and see what happens if we put material in at each of those as the first step. And then we can use those to sort of mix and match and say, how do, how do we actually design that strategy? So this is just uh, the plot here um, is the, the bottom is the surface um, going up in altitude. And, this, and then on the left side is the South Pole, the right side is the North Pole. Um, and this dashed line is showing the height of the tropopause. And the black and yellow points are the places that we tried putting material in. So either injecting close to the tropopause, just barely into the stratosphere, or significantly above that. Um, and for reference, uh, when you go fly in a commercial aircraft, um, uh, you at high latitudes, you are in the stratosphere just slightly, but you're just barely in the stratosphere. Um, and at lower latitudes, where you have much more influence on the climate system, um, your sub you know, current aircraft just cannot do that. You need, you need to be quite a ways. You need to be above the, the tropopause. You need to be much, much higher than current aircraft can fly. I'll come back to that point later on. So here's where the sulfate aerosols uh, wind up when you do that. If you inject the aerosols at the equator, you wind up with a peak um, in the aerosol concentrations at the equator. So each of these plots, again, is altitude um, on the vertical axis and south pole to the north pole on the horizontal axis. Um, if you inject in the northern hemisphere, the aerosols are, stay more in the northern hemisphere. Um, and if you look at how that affects the temperature, um, the, the red, I didn't show you which corresponds to which, but unsurprisingly, these red and purple cases with more cooling in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, that's what happens when you inject in the northern hemisphere. When you inject in the southern hemisphere, you get the reverse. There's a, the hemispheres are not symmetric because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere. So you can use this to basically tailor how you design your, your uh, injections to reduce some of the side effects. So knowing that where we used the knowledge to compose the first geoengineering large ensemble, and we use an algorithm that specified where the injections were going to go to try to keep to the goals. And we used our older version of the model, CSM1 Wacom here, and we went against the most extreme scenario. And the part of the project we were looking at here was to see whether we could keep the temperature at about 2020 mean, so about present day levels. It was not a realistic implementation uh, in the modeling framework even. We we're trying to see if we could do it and how much cooling could we offset, how much cooling could we produce using stratospheric aerosols. So um, in the simulation, you know, we have to keep injecting more and more as under the RCP 8.5 scenario, it's getting warmer and warmer. 
And in order to offset the warming from the CO2 emissions, we need to put in about one pin one pin of tube or about 20 teragrams of SO2 uh, by about year 2050. And if you wanted to keep going business as usual and use climate intervention just to cool the temperatures down, which is not what we're advocating here, but if you, uh, we would just want to see what happens, by 2080, you would need to be putting in two Mount Pinatubos every single year. So that's a lot of SO2 going into the stratosphere. However, uh, we showed, and if you go to the next slide, that this works actually really well. So the black line here is the global mean temperature without intervention, and the purple here is with intervention relative to about 2020. And you see that we can keep the temperatures um, pretty much uh, at a very constant level. And what does this look like in latitude? So I'm looking here at this period from 2075 to 2095, this end of the century, versus this base period that's around centered about 2020. And again, a reminder, if you do not do anything, then the temperature changes are gonna be very large, mostly in the polar regions. But if we do uh, apply intervention, then most of the changes disappear, except for a little warming here in the Atlantic and in the Northern Europe. And similarly for precipitation, if you don't do anything under the RCP 8.5 scenario, there'd be tremendous changes in precipitation, a lot of wetting, but uh, with intervention, most of those will be reduced to very few changes. So if we go to the next slide, uh, a lot of people have been analyzing Glenn's or changing large ensemble for all sorts of impact. So a recent study from a person here, Mari Tai at Inkar, has looked at uh, extreme weather and extreme events. So this is showing changes in warmest nights. Again, with no intervention, warm nights are getting warmer and warmer. However, with intervention, we're pretty close to back to present day climate, except for a few areas like uh, the United States where we still have slightly warmer nights than we would have otherwise, but much cooler than if we didn't apply intervention. Unfortunately, other parts of the system uh, do not benefit for climate intervention and in particular the ozone hole. So the black here shows you um, October total column ozone in the RCP 8.5 scenario. And you see the dip down in the 1980s and 90s, and we're now on a recovery path, and we're, we're on a path to recover by, by around 2040. If we apply climate intervention, unfortunately, that would be delayed uh, probably, I would say, 2090 or 2100. And that's because when we're putting aerosols in the stratosphere, then you're causing a lot of heating, which changes the temperature in the lower stratosphere and water vapor, and there's lots of chemical reactions that occur then cause cause depletion of ozone uh, to just last longer. And then go on to the next slide. However, other parts of the Earth system have a tremendous benefit. So this is Arctic sea ice, and the black line is the RCP 8.5 scenario. In our model, it shows that there would be hardly any sea ice left by, by 2050. And if we do apply intervention, we can restore that to present levels or even above that. And you similarly, you see that pictures on the right for 2080, you see that there would be no sea ice in the Arctic by that time. And if we applied intervention, you could get it back. Next slide. So recently we repeated this set of experiments uh, in our version, newer version of the model, CSM2 Wacom 6. And we didn't exactly repeat them. We tried to make the setup more realistic and also consider a more moderate emission scenario. So we would be able to look at the responses called climate intervention to make the impacts what might be more expected rather than this drastic scenario. So this new set of simulations is called ARISE SAI, or Assessing Responses and Impacts of Solar Climate Intervention on the Earth System with Stratospheric Aerosol Injection. Okay, that's a mouthful. So we'll use ARISE SAI moving forward and in particular, Arise SAI 1.5, because we decided to cool to about one and a half degrees above the uh, pre-industrial value. And as with CSM1 and CSM2, we can perfectly, well, not perfectly, but we can do a really good job keeping the global mean temperature to our target level below what the SSP245 projection is. But if you go to the next slide, the regional impacts are a little bit different. 
So what I'm comparing here is the residual changes in temperature on the top and on the bottom in precipitation on the right from Glens. So that was run with our earlier model and with Arise with our newest model. And what you see is that in Arise, we show a little cooling in the Atlantic. And in Glens, we were seeing warming over the Atlantic and in Northern Europe. Well, you may wonder which one is right, which one would happen? And similarly for precipitation, in this pink box, I'm highlighting that, for example, Australia was predicted to be wetter, and then it's no longer predicted to be wet. It was our newest model. So this is where the largest uncertainty is in this research, and that's the regional impacts. So if you go on to the next slide, all of the research we have done has shown that using stratospheric aerosols can absolutely reduce global mean temperature. The more you put in, the more you can reduce. All that's been very, uh, uh, very straightforward and in agreement with basic physics and our model, all the models are getting the similar answers. However, we are not getting much confidence in what the regional residual changes would be from present day. So we know that the changes will be lower, much lower than if we don't do anything. However, we don't exactly know in the given region of the world whether it might be a little wetter, a little drier relative to present day. The changes will definitely be lower relative to an climate without any intervention. And why is that? Well, it goes back to what our climate models can and cannot do. So I described a few slides back that our grid boxes are about 100 by 100 kilometers in the horizontal and then about uh, 500 meters stick in the vertical. But if you think of releasing any particles from the back of an airplane or releasing a plume, those interactions happen on much smaller scales. So we make assumptions on what happens inside of those boxes. Similarly, if you think of clouds and cloud droplets and rain droplets, they are much smaller than the grid boxes of our models. So everything in those boxes that's Sub, um, grid scale, what we call needs to be parameterized. So we use approximations to, um, to assume what's going to happen in there. And we do our best to verify that with existing observations. But there are uncertainties. And that's what causes differences between our different versions of the models. And the uncertainties are in every part of the system, in the stratosphere, in the ozone chemistry, in the ocean, in particular, with regard to the Atlantic meridional returning circulation or AMOC, and also in the representation of key modes of variability, for example, El Nino, et cetera. So we know climate, what climate intervention can do in many ways. However, the tiny details, this is where a lot of research is still needed. So I'm gonna, uh, I'll wrap up in a few minutes here, but. Um, so I'll say a, a, just a little bit about uh, the technologies that one would need to do this. Um, so as I had mentioned earlier, there are no aircraft that exist today that can both get to a sufficient altitude and do that while lofting a payload. Um, aircraft, by the way, look like the by far the most likely way that you could get material to the stratosphere. In principle, there's a, there's, there are other ways to do that as well. So the picture shown here, this is from a colleague, uh, Wake Smith at Yale. Um, he has a background in aircraft. Uh, he works with a number of aircraft designers and they basically sort of did this thought experiment. It's like, well, could we actually go design an airplane to do this? Um, and their answer more or less is yes, you could use fairly straightforward technology that we understand. You could go design a new airplane. It would probably cost you something like $5 billion to design it. Um, and it would take about five years to develop. And they figured that it would be relatively straightforward to design something that could get to about 70,000 feet or 21 kilometers. This, by the way, is one of the reasons that we changed uh, in the, if you look back at Glens and some of those original simulations that I had shown, we were injecting material as high as 25 kilometers in the stratosphere. Um, and we concluded that that's just not realistic. Um, and so understanding what's actually possible from an engineering perspective then affects, well, what we actually go simulate in the climate models. So it's not that we're trying to, you know, to, uh, it's definitely premature to actually be developing deployment technology, but it's important to understand what's possible just so that one knows, what, so that one's simulating uh, useful things. 
Um, and then the actual cost of deployment, um, this would not be a small effort when's talking about putting um, millions and millions of tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere every year. It would be really, really easy to see that from satellites. Uh, it would require uh, quite a few aircraft um, with constant flying up to the stratosphere, coming back down, reloading, going back up to the stratosphere. The number sort of depends on how many, how much you're trying to cool, uh, but it would basically be like a small airline um, or the operations of a fairly decent sized airport. So you wouldn't be able to hide these operations at all. Uh, they're not cheap uh, by my perspective. Um, the nut costs would be measured in tens of billions of dollars per year. But when you compare that with what the impacts of climate change are, it's cost is not going to be the reason uh, to avoid doing this. There's lots of other concerns with doing it, uh, but cost isn't ultimately going to be the barrier. Um, on talking about implementation, this is the slide that I showed earlier, on, or the, the figure I showed earlier on the top left showing the tropopause height. The tropopause is lower at high latitudes. And so it, there is a valid question of saying, well, could you do this with existing aircraft if you went to higher latitudes? Um, so that's another strategy that we've been looking at just at a, to understand what the implications would be. Um, again, not a recommendation that one does it, but to uh, use climate models to understand what could be done. Um, and there's definitely advantages to that as well. So the uh, plots I've shown here on the left is September sea ice mid-century um, without any intervention at all. The middle plot uh, is coming from a rise. Uh, so these is a, a global strategy using injection at four different latitudes to try to overall balance the impacts on the climate change. If you took roughly the same injection rates and you put them all in at high latitude, you would actually do a much better job at restoring sea ice. Of course, you'd do a much worse job at some other things. So there's clearly going to be some trade-offs there uh, to understand what are the range of choices that are available and what are the implications from those. Um, so that, and, and as I said, one of the reasons for considering that strategy is that that actually is much more implementable um, uh, with relatively easier aircraft technology. Um, and then uh, in, from a research perspective, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but there's a number of, one could basically, sky's the limit, right? One could, uh, uh, no pun intended, look at, look at multiple different strategies and understand what the impacts of each of them would be. So when you're thinking about what would uh, stratospheric aerosol injection do to the climate system, the answer is not just that we don't know because of the uncertainties, but also that it depends on how you do it. So each of these will have a different set of impacts and a different set of uh, uh, risks associated with it to some extent. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some of those uh, slides and talk a little bit more about what we need to know. Um, and I just pose this a bit more as a thought experiment back to you. So imagine now, transport yourself forward to 2030. Um, let's assume for the sake of argument that we've managed to, that emissions have now peaked and they're declining, but uh, we've already passed one and a half degrees of warming. And if you project where we're gonna wind up being, we're gonna look more like two and a half degrees. And keep in mind that these pictures on the right, those come from a climate system that is only warmed by 1.2 degrees Celsius. So if we're gonna warm by twice as much, things are going to be at least twice as bad. Um, so one can reasonably project more and stronger heat waves, forest fires, storms, and so forth. Um, Arctic summer sea ice might be pretty, a lot smaller in 2030 than it is now. Uh, there are risks coming from places like Antarctic ice shelves. We don't know when we, uh, how much warming it takes to destabilize those. Um, permafrost is already showing signs of thawing. We don't know what the rate of future thaw will be. Um, so all of these statements are plausible. Um, now imagine we're in this future world um, and you hear a talk from Yaga and I that looks kind of like the one we gave today and says, well, we know we can cool the planet, but we don't know the details. What do you do? Um, and in some sense, more importantly, what do you wish you knew? 
because that's what we need to spend the next eight years or 10 years or whatever doing research to better understand. So we need to do a better job of understanding what we think will happen. How does that depend on the choices that we can make? Uh, what are the uncertainties? So being able to say, not just here's our best guess, but here's sort of the range of possible outcomes that could happen. Um, and you need all of that information to be able to ultimately support some sort of informed decisions about these technologies. Um, so that's also the basis for uh, recommendations from the US National Academy report that was released last year. I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, it emphasizes some of the same things that we just said about uh, not being a substitute for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that our current knowledge is not enough to support informed decisions. I mean, in particular, it recommended that the US go forward with creating um, a research program um, and coordinate that with other countries. Um, and that that research program shouldn't just be addressing the physical sciences, but should also be addressing the social sciences. Um, and that there ought to be adequate research governance associated with that as well. So I'm going to wrap up there. Um, we, of course, should be reducing our CO2 emissions uh, much more aggressively than we are. I think a lot, a lot of us would, would support that. Uh, but even if we do, hopefully that will be adequate. Uh, but we may need to also, in the future, consider additional options. Um, research is pretty early stages right now. Uh, we need a large, if we really want to support informed decisions, we need to a um, much more aggressive research program. Um, and climate model simulations are a core piece of that. That's the only way that you ever project the future is using a climate model. Um, and you can use that to help understand how would you actually do this the way that maximizes benefits, minimizes risks? Um, what do you think would happen and how confident are we? So I will wrap up there um, and uh, Yaga and I are happy to take your questions. Great, well, thank you so much, Doug and Yaga for the wonderful presentation, um, giving us some insight on what it does take to, to create these models. And it's, it's, it was nice for me to hear that you're being strategic about placing goals for what you want in the model rather than just trial and error um, as, as um, I can always do trial and error, but it's, it's good to have goals in mind. And we do have um, some questions from the audience. So thank you everybody for, for um, submitting those. And you're also welcome to submit them on Slido if you haven't already joined, definitely um, scroll down the page and join Slido. Um, great, so let's go ahead and see the first question from David. Um, or the, uh, yeah, let's just see what the first question is. Is it possible to design a technology that can counter the stratospheric aerosol injection to accelerate the fading process of the particles? Um, I, I think my answer to that would be that I don't think it's absolutely necessary. So I was not specific. I don't think either of us were specific. The aerosol lifetime in the stratosphere is of order a year. So if you, you have to constantly replenish to keep the aerosol layer there. Um, and if you stop, basically the aerosols will go away after about a year. Um, and then of course, this is one of the risks. If anybody were relying on this and then ever stopped, then there's a termination shock where the temperatures sort of gra go back up to where they would have been if you were never doing it at all. Um, so you could in principle, I guess I haven't thought of ways that one could accelerate that, but the uh, you know you can you can you can view the re this uh, the reversibility as a good thing, right? If you if you decide that you don't want to do it, the effect goes away. Great, thank you so much because I did see that that was part of the model input is the injection rate and how often and where in that Earth model you actually injected. So that's awesome. Um, let's go ahead to see the next question. It says, if carbon dioxide emissions go to zero, won't sequestration by, for example, trees, plants um, help reduce what's left? Manoa Loa carbon dioxide data shows seasonal variation due to this. Um, so maybe I'll take this one as well. Um, yes, 
uh, is the short answer. I think I was not, uh, I wasn't precise when I sort of uh, went through that. Um, if you zero emissions today, um, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere will fall because some of that CO2 will continue to be taken up by the biosphere and by the ocean. It is also true that the earth is not yet uh, in equilibrium with the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere. So if you held the CO2 levels constant, temperature would continue to rise. If you stop emissions, the CO2 levels actually fall, they don't stay constant, and those effects roughly sort of to first order balance each other. So that when you go to zero emissions, CO2 levels fall, but the temperatures roughly remain constant. Thank you. Great, let's go ahead and see the next one says, are there other choices besides SO2 or sulfur dioxide to inject? Are there better choices than what volcanoes do naturally? I can take that one. So the reason we do what volcanoes do naturally is because we have observations and to verify our models. So if we consider it something that hasn't happened in nature, we would first have to study in the lab then you would perhaps do field experiments and then uh, putting it in a stratosphere and having a measurement system around it is not a simple issue. So there is an idea of a calcium carbonate uh, that a group at Harvard is studying and that would not have the issue of stratospheric, stratospheric heating. However, again, that does not occur in nature. Therefore, we would need to repeat a lot more studies in order to have any confidence in the results. Thank you. How will this intervention impact large systems like the polar vortex, which depends on the temperature gradient between the poles and the equator or the Gulf Stream? All right, so I'll take that one as well. It follows from the previous one that if you put in sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, which you will actually create a layer in the lower stratosphere of heating, and that there will uh, by thermal wind balance, change the circulations and in particular strengthen the polar stratospheric vortex. And indeed, they would have influences down at the surface. And it's one of the reasons why we do carry out these large ensembles with our models, because there's already lots of variability in the polar vortex. And so we need to really have a lot of ensemble members, a lot of simulations to see which direction that would change. And I think on a similar note, uh, we have looked at the AMOC and uh, in CSM1, the AMOC recovers, and in CSM2, it does not. So there is a lot we don't understand, but we do know for sure there will be stratospheric heating, there will be changes in the polar vortex, and by coupling down, there will be residual changes. And that's where a lot of our research is going beyond the basic physics and examining um, uh, different aspects of the Earth system. So I think about 30 papers have already come out of Glenn's, the data set, that we ran in 2000, early 2017. And there's already lots of researchers starting to look at a rise. Great, it's, it's good to hear that it's an active um, point of research currently. So there's definitely um, opportunities for people that are interested in, in doing this type of work. Um, the next question asks, does the problem to be solved seem futile or are you inspired by your work? I don't know, maybe that's for both of us, but um, per personally, I, you know, I, I think it's easy when people have not heard of this topic much before, talking about this sounds a little bit like we failed, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, if I get into a car, I might hope that I'm not getting into a car accident, but I'm very happy to have airbags and seat belts. Um, I don't, you know, I don't smoke, um, but you know, if I'm at risk of cancer, I'm happy to know that there's chemotherapy out there. Um, so when I'm originally getting involved in this, it's it's recognizing that climate change is going to cause an awful lot of suffering. If there's a technology out there that has the potential to reduce that suffering, um, then to me, it seems really, really worthwhile to try to understand it. Same time, I, you know, 
uh, like I said, I, I would rather be in a world where we did not have to use rely on this. And I, I still hope that we can all work towards that world. Yeah, what I find hardest about the work is that we know how much time it takes to do good research and we're up against a ticking clock. So I think a lot of the people who work in the field, they spend a lot of time on their weekends, their nights. Some of the students and postdoc that Doug has working, I, they, they are always online. You can always get an email back from them because they realize the urgency of the problem. And there is just simply not enough people doing the research that we will have the answers to the questions that people want to know if, people, if we reach the point uh, that we want to consider this. So hopefully the society of all the countries in the world will get it together and we don't have to go there. But it's, again, the problem is that it's increasingly less and less likely that some sort of intervention uh, will be needed. So hopefully, maybe that's in the form of carbon dioxide removal, maybe those technologies will be available. But I think uh, the hardest part is that we're really up against the clock and the resources for this research have been uh, limited. Yeah, but it's good that at least we have, like um, Doug, you were saying, the opportunity to, to do these computational models to kind of see what would be the impact of doing this type of work. Um, does the aircraft have to be manned or could we use satellite or space tourism technologies is a question that was asked as well. My personal view would be I don't see what the purpose of putting a person in the cockpit of the aircraft would be. Um, right now, quite frankly, if you're ever behind in an airliner and the pilot disappears for some reason, the airplane's gonna go to its destination and land because it's programmed to do that. Um, so, you know, we use pilots and aircraft for the extreme cases where, uh, you know, for, for the unexpected. Um, I would assume myself that if you were ever going to do this, you would not be operating out of a commercial aircraft, you would not be in commercial airspace and you would not have a pilot. Um, but I know Wake Smith who actually did the studies that I was referring to, he actually thinks otherwise. So we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, how confident are you that you sufficiently understand the physics of climate to define the parameters for the climate models? I'm not sure which parameters, okay. I'm not sure which <laughs> parameters of the climate model there. Are, so there are parameters that we uh, make assumptions about and we try to validate them on the present and the historical record. Um, so that's the plots that I've showed. We are certain that with our models that we can reproduce the historical record and it gives us confidence for looking into the future. But we are, yes, there is an uncertainty that some things, and especially due to the rapid change in the earth system, that some of the relationships that we assume that they will hold may no longer hold. And then there is an amount of uncertainty. And luckily the approach that uh, we've been working with Doug, again, because of this uh, background in aerospace engineering and control theory, that the algorithm is designed to change, right? So if we're not meeting our goal, then you can adjust for that. You can inject more or you can inject less. I, I might just sort of add in broad context, we're never going to reduce the uncertainty to zero, right? There's uncertainty in the climate in the what will happen if we don't do geoengineering and there's always going to be uncertainty in what happens if we do um, hopefully we can reduce the uncertainty and we can at least bound it to some extent uh, enough to be able to support an informed decision that says let you know either let's not go forward um, or let's go forward in moderation and monitor what goes on and learn more and hopefully find a way that if one is going to deploy it, that one can do that in a responsible way that minimizes the risks. But you don't have to have, you don't wind up needing perfect knowledge to do that, um, hopefully better than what we have right now. Thank you. And um, what's the expected impact of enhanced sulfate deposition? Is, is that something that you have studied as well? Yeah, my, what I'm, postdoc working with me, um, Dan Vizioni, actually wrote a paper on that last year. Um, 
the amount of sulfate uh, pollution that we put in the form of industrial pollution right now is truly enormous. Um, it's of order 100 million tons a year of sulfur dioxide. That comes down in the form of things like acid rain, um, mostly relatively close to where you put it up. If you were to put material up into the sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, uh, of order, say, 10 million tons would cool the planet by an entire degree Celsius. So that's like a 10% increase on what we're currently doing. Um, because the industrial pollution comes down close to where people put it up, um, those places aren't going to be affected at all. Uh, but places that are currently more pristine could see an increase in acid rain. That's a risk that one really needs to understand and, and weigh relative to the other impacts. Yeah, so again, future areas of study, and it's good that your graduate student was able to, to, to write about that. Um, next question says, has there been progress on research governance since the NAS 2021 report? What is NCAR doing to advance research governance and oversight? I gotta let you take the first part of the question. I think the answer is no. Um, that right now that 2021 report uh, is sort of the de facto best rec set of recommendations. Nothing in particular has been implemented beyond sort of the basic governance that would apply to anything, right? So you can't go do an outdoor experiment without satisfying environmental uh, oversight, but there aren't right now any specific recommendations in addition to that uh, if somebody were con to consider doing outdoor research. Um, I do, I am aware that there's language, congressional language recommending more effort uh, be done to understand research governance. And on the NCAR sites, our focus is the physical science, the modeling of the earth system, but we do have an effort, it's called the Community Climate Intervention Strategies uh, effort led by Simona Tilms and trying to bring together different people from different fields, including governance. And so I don't foresee that ever being our key, our primary area of expertise, but we certainly want to be working with those individuals and communicating with them at various venues. Thank you. Let's see, the question asks, how well do the current models fit the known historical volcanic eruptions. Were any changes needed to be made to the models to better fit the cooling scene? So I'll take that one. So actually we have a scientist called Michael Mills in our chemistry laboratory, and he specializes with that. And I think he even gave an Explorer series lecture. So he's done a lot of work on this with CSM Wacom. And I think our model is one of the best models to be capturing the effects of volcanic eruptions. Uh, and as Doug said, for example, Mount Pinatubo observations show us that um, it emitted about 10 to 20 teragrams of SO2. And in order for our model to get the right temperature cooling and the right distribution of aerosol optical depth, I know Mike has to use 10 teragrams, so on the lower end of things. So which other models may need to use a little bit more. So that's where that uncertainty comes in. And, um, you know, that comes back to the different aerosol parametrizations, how the size distributions that we make, again, it comes down to the assumptions that we make about the things that are not resolved in the models. Thank you. Um, the next question asks, given a small change in impinging light makes a significant difference, are there trends or forecasts on solar output for any part of the future? So I, there is a, we can go ahead. <laughs> there is an 11 year solar cycle where the solar uh, variance varies by about 0.1% per year. So a lot of that is already uh, captured in our models and it's an 11 year solar cycle. That's a pretty slow varying. So that's something we can put in the models, but uh, those, yeah. So, so we try our best to do, to capture long-term changes. Yeah, and those those changes are even smaller than the changes that we're talking about. Thank you. 
um, does SO2 or would SO2 affect air quality at the lower levels? And I think you, you briefly talked about this. Uh, yes, to some extent. So again, there's the comparative relative to what our current pollution is. Of course, our current pollution is a big problem, right? We, we should be cleaning that up regardless. Um, the other thing is the size distribution because they've been in the stratosphere for a little bit longer. The particles tend to be a little bit larger. When they come to the surface, they wind up almost entirely coming out as wet uh, deposition, so in rain rather than dry. Um, and so uh, I don't, I think my best understanding is that it is not a significant contributor directly in terms of uh, to air quality. Thank you. And I know um, you kind of also mentioned this um, the alternative to the SO2, um, just in case people didn't, um, weren't able to capture that first question response. Yes. Um, so I think, I think Yaga mentioned earlier that calcium carbonate or calcite, uh, there are other, there's lots of other things that could in principle work, but that's probably the only other one that's sort of seriously considered. It's just that we don't have the, we don't even have the data really to put that into the climate model with any confidence right now. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for a highly informative talk. Um, and for those of you watching, we will have a survey that goes out if you registered through Eventbrite. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on how you um, how this talk went and how we can continue to improve our Explorer series lecture. Um, we don't see any more questions that have come in. So I think um, Doug and Yaga for being able to answer those questions and for a great talk as well. Again, we will have this lecture up on our Explorer series website um, for future reference. Um, and with that, I don't know, Doug and Yaga, if you have any closing thoughts or anything you wanted to, anything else you'd like to leave us with? But Jess, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Likewise. <laughs> Well, thank you so much both. And um, thank you everybody for joining and tuning in for this Explorer series. We look forward to um, seeing you in the future for our next talk. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you and um, reach out if you need anything. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.